All right. Hi, everybody. I'm going to get the session started. My name is Carly Schoenlieber, and I work for USGBCLA. And in this session, we're going to hear about building a compassionate community, empathy as a core principle of design practice. And with that, I'll hand it off to the speakers to introduce themselves. Thanks. Hi, good morning. I'm Sarah Barnard. I'm excited to share with you an exploration into the design of spaces, products, and experiences centered on empathy as a foundational element of design practice. At Daisy, Julie and I were introduced last year by Leslie Roberts, co-founders of Textile Arts LA. I'm grateful to Leslie for putting us together and in being the first one to invite us to speak on this topic. In this session, we'll each share for approximately 10 minutes. At the conclusion of the presentations, we welcome your questions. It is with pleasure that I introduce our first speaker, architect and product designer, Julie Smith Clementi. Thank you, Sarah. Let me share my screen. Okay, good morning. Um, yeah, it's, it's really great to be able to uh, come together again and uh, rework this presentation uh, that we gave that really talks about empathy as a, as a core principle in our design practice. Um, I would like to, to start by acknowledging that I come to you today from Venice, California, which is part of the traditional ancestral territory of the Chumash and Tongva people. I'm an architect um, and my husband and I recently started our own firm where we spent the previous 30 years working with a multidisciplinary group of people at uh, Rios Comente Hale Studios. And for us, design is holistic and includes the disciplines of architecture, interior design, graphics, landscape, urban design, and product design. Uh, everything we do starts with the perspective of the user and they are never the same. Um, our work exists at many different scales uh, from the intimate to the vast. And I think these shifting perspectives along with kind of an innate curiosity have helped us to leverage our experience uh, for diverse communities. Um, so, um, you know, I was, I was just listening to Dr. Fairchild's uh, keynote speech and um, I think she touched on some, some issues that I might be touching on today in a really powerful way. I've, I've broken this talk down uh, into two parts um, and um, starting, you know, with basically empathy, um, every, you know, that it is how we see the world through uh, other people's eyes, how we feel, what they feel, how we can experience what they, as they experience. And um, we believe it's a critical part of a human-centered design approach. Um, so the first part uh, of this talk, um, I really felt like we needed to kind of grapple with the issues uh, of our time that are so, you know, that are really, we're all living every day now, COVID, homelessness, Black Lives Matter, and police uh, brutality. Um, so these issues, I think, can be looked at through the lens of empathy. Um, and the, the thing that I wanna start with is, is this police brutality is clear and a present danger. And what are the mechanisms that have set up an organization that is suspicious of the other? And I think if we look at design uh, uh, in law enforcement, we can understand a bit of how we got here and where we could go. So for instance, this police cruiser, the black and white car, does it support the message of protect and serve? Does it look inviting, hopeful, or helpful? Um, on the other hand, artist Ed Massey put these amazing flowers all over these taxi cabs in New York City. Could something like this change or reinforce the message that the police are actually want us to believe? Um, and who is this building protecting and serving? The LA police headquarters in downtown looks to me like it's protecting its own. This building looks like a wall. But unlike that, my local fire station, um, where the door is always open, and there's a bench out front and people usually on it and a community garden next door um, may, is inviting and is a place that I would go to to be protected. So who understands their mission of to protect and to serve? 
During the, oops, sorry. Uh, during the Black Lives Matter protest in May, my local street, Abbott Kinney Boulevard, was, was completely boarded up. A couple of days later, an artist known as Muckrock painted, started painting these really uh, beautiful portraits of the latest victims of police brutality. But what is the message that you send to the community when your response to the other, to the protesters, to the outsiders, is only to protect yourself? Do the paintings assuage their guilt? Do they understand that they want to keep you out while they're also saying that they're part of your community? It felt to me like cognitive dissonance um, or simple hypocrisy. Um, homelessness is an issue that we've been trying to deal with for some time. Unfortunately, COVID has made that worse. Shelters open up and people try to make the best of it. Some use sheets and blankets to create some sort of privacy, block out the constant bright lights and create their own space. Pre-COVID, I saw this exhibit at the A plus D Museum that Perkins and Will installed showing a better design for homeless shelters that treats people with dignity. They designed for someone's actual experience with a piece of furniture that provides for basic convenience, like a place to charge your phone, a place to store your stuff securely. And they added a movable cover that affords that most basic need for shelter. Um, prior to COVID, uh, my husband and I started working on a proposal for the LA Forum that had to do with costumes to ameliorate issues like climate change. Uh, we were in research mode when, when post-COVID, we started seeing these amazing responses uh, to protecting yourself from the virus, like these hats based on the Song Dynasty courtier's hat. The emperor didn't want yeah. the people in his, in his court um, getting too close to each other. So he designed this hat that would keep them apart so they wouldn't whisper and talk behind his back. Um, and so children in China have adopted this idea um, but they've made their own versions of these hats to keep themselves apart. Kids in classrooms wearing uniforms uh, use their masks and hats as expressions of their individuality. The virus is scary, but this gives kids some level of control. So, so this, to part two, this is you know, more just looking at, at how to apply this issue of empathy to the design process. Um, for the past 25 years, we've been designing spaces and places for children. We like to say that our work for them has sort of heightened our awareness of other. Typically, child care centers are designed for kids from six months to five years old. They change uh, their experiences over these five years and how they occupy space. Those changes are just enormous. Um, so how do you design for beings that go through this much transition in such a short amount of time? They can't eat by themselves. They can't use a toilet. They can't walk. And when they can walk, they still can't read. So you have to you know, literally get down on all fours and see the world from their perspective. A shelf can be a fort. And on top of that, you have to see things from the perspective of their parents, from their caregivers, from often the HR group or whoever the, the organization is that's, that's uh, wanted this building to be there and always you have to look at it from the perspective of the facilities and maintenance group so it's a complex user group all with very different wants and needs that requires a serious amount of empathy uh, at caltech the parents are all scientists <laughs> the center was run with a, a steam uh, pedagogy so science technology engineering art and math uh, in their curriculum and we wanted the center to reflect the local ecosystem like local ecosystems on a micro scale. The centers in Pasadena where the mountains are omnipresent and the water, man and water management is, is, is a huge issue. When it rains, where does it go? What is an arroyo? Where do, what plants grow near them? So we create an opportunity for kids to learn about these issues within their own space and play yards, giving them their own arroyo that they can control, fed by large cisterns that collect water from the roof. Pieces of the project are made visible to be used as teaching moments. Um, and what better way to develop empathy than to more fully understand your context. The buildings working with the landscape and the environment pieces were made understandable. And these were key drivers of the project that earned a, a LEED Gold certification. So while we say empathy was installed in our psyche by working with children, we've recently been more conscious of how to incorporate this into our design process. This Venn type diagram from uh, Charles and Ray Ames left uh, 
starts with the question of why do you want to do something? Who is it for? What are your shared interests? They said that design happens with conviction and enthusiasm in the overlapping areas of interest. And in our case, we think of those overlapping areas as empathy. Um, we've been working on mapping a design process. Uh, the process is based on principles outlined in Nigel Cross's book, Design Thinking, where the design values are practicality, ingenuity, and empathy. And where instead of working to narrow down a solution called convergent thinking, uh, we use divergent thinking to explore and test many possibilities. Divergent thinking is a nonlinear process that you see appearing in many different fields and is very popular and the process can be applied to many different problems. But the process always starts with empathy. It is used, it used to be the design was about the object or the form um, and some sort of preconceived notion of what that form is. And now design thinking is broader, non-linear, non-linear, it's more of an iterative process, uh, which seeks to understand users' challenges, assumptions, and redefines problems to create innovative solutions for prototyping and testing that is then shared with the user. But in learning about the user, we also believe there's another layer to that, and that has to do with culture. And we think that's integral to understanding their motivation. And we're only successful as designers when we create unique expressive experiences through this process. So a couple of examples. Uh, we started a product design company about 20 years ago that, that started in housewares and then took a fork in the road and focused on the barista and the customer needs uh, in the specialty coffee industry. Almost 10 years ago, we were asked by Intelligentsia to help them with what I'll call their last three foot problem. They worked with farmers to source coffee beans from around the world. They shipped the beans to Chicago. They used their best equipment to roast the beans. They bought the best brewing machines. They created beautiful cafes for people to sit in and take Instagram photos, but they did not control the drink experience for their baristas or for their customers. The cups they used were hard to pour into, poor quality, plain looking, hard to hold and clunky to drink out of. All that work and they didn't control the most important part of the experience, the making and the enjoying of the beverage. The process involved zero empathy for the human users. Through a process of research, ideation, prototyping and testing with baristas, we were able to design a cup that accomplished all the technical aspects that they required while also giving customers an amazing experience through ergonomics in the hand, great mouthfeel, balance, temperature, insulation, and, and retention, all while accomplishing the original goal of the client, which was to create something iconic. We then expanded the line to include teacups and glass vessels, and we used that same iterative process with different experts and different users. About that same time, as part of a patron experience improvement, the Hollywood Bowl asked us to look at their site and design furniture that could help enhance their treasured picnic experience. Um, the one that had people setting up blankets on steep crowded walking paths, um, their main prompt to us was, how can we help people eat on a hill? Um, so we visited the, the site many times during typical concert nights and observed many different situations. You can see some on the left here where people had figured out a way to ingest food before performance, very few of which look like what you would think of as picnic. Uh, people set up blankets on flattish surfaces and they were literally on top of each other and in the way of people walking to their seats. We developed a system that got people off the ground and provided flat surfaces to set out their bites and kept them safe and out of the way. The system worked its way up hills, around trees, and added a pop of color to a sort of wood park bench so that it was easier to spot in a crowd. Picnicking is now abundant and accessible, branded as the thing to do. The experience is transformed and its value is celebrated. So I'm, you know, in, in these times, um, I'm still optimistic. Um, and while empathy was not really part of my education um, or my early training as an architect, um, I've learned some and I work at it every day. Um, and the good news though, is that I see my daughter is incorporating empathy uh, in her daily school life, uh, where collaboration and understanding are valued and allow for a greater connection and learning to happen in more meaningful ways. The good news is that empathy is incorporated more and more into the design process. And today, more than ever, everything we do, say, and design should be through the lens of how does it inspire, challenge, and affect the user. 
And with that, I will stop my sharing and pass this off to Daisy Cadet, who is an architect here in Los Angeles. All right. Hello, everyone. We're going to look at designing with empathy at HKS and what it means for our industry. First, I'll start with a little bit about me. I'm from Sacramento. I'm a twin. And like those are my BFF. I went to Philadelphia University, Prairie View a and University, and started working with HKS in the Dallas office. I've been with HKS for 15 years, and currently I'm a vice president in the Los Angeles office, and I serve, on this, I serve as a sustainability champion, a justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion council member, and I sit on the LA Design Fellowship Committee. So here we have four public housing projects that look very similar, except for the two on the left are prisons. Long, architects have been designing buildings in low-income and marginalized communities with no regard for the people that inhabit these spaces. We should be approaching every project with the same level of empathy and design rigor that we reserve for the quote-unquote right clients in the right neighborhoods. We should take the time to learn about the communities we build in, understand the user needs, and set sustainability goals that marry with their client's vision. It's time we rethink the way we practice architecture and embed these one-time extras into the way we approach every project. To do this, we start by infusing empathy into our designs. At HKS, we do this through our responsible design framework. In it, we clearly define the project stakeholders, follow a clear process, and understand the project site through the nature of place study. Our responsible design framework uses a thoughtful approach driven by systems thinking. It's deliberate, integrative and innovative. We encourage, we engage as thinking partners, establish guiding principles with performance targets and deliver impact by achieving these targeted outcomes. The five key stakeholders are the community that surrounds the project, the client and or user that interacts with the project, the earth because, well, duh, the co-creators and who encompass the traditional project team, and the client and the capital who covers the cost of the project and may or may not be the end user as well. These key stakeholders play a critical role in the decision-making process throughout the entire design. It's important to understand their point of view, individual goals, concerns, and desired outcomes. The process of responsible design starts by establishing a transparent studio to allow for critical dialogue and team communication. Then we set guiding principles to define the project's impact through alignment workshops and integrative design. We add value as thinking partners by providing research to define, design, and deliver the best solution for all stakeholders. The next key component to designing with empathy at HKS is what we call the nature of place. Through research, the goals are to reveal the unique character of the site, to set holistic design, to seek holistic design solutions, to collaborate, integrate, and craft a shared purpose. Here's an example of what a study looks like for a project we did in Austin, Texas. We studied the site through the lens of these seven categories, three of which I'll expand on in the following slides. The neighborhood fabric category addresses the site's adjacency to site's adjacencies and extends to the community scale. We look for answers to questions like these. What are the opportunities to provide value to the community beyond the property line? And how are people likely to be arriving at the site? The energy and carbon section focuses on ways to shift the cultural dependency on dirty energy to renewable energy options that are more sustainable, plus ways to counteract emissions. For power, we ask, what are the appropriate energy use intensity targets for the building? And what active technologies and strategies should be considered to reduce energy consumption for the building? Under waste and recycling, we, we ask, what should, what should be the approach or protocol to addressing recycling? And is it possible to manage on-site waste to achieve waste diversion goals? We look at renewable energy as well. And we ask, are there incentives available to subsidize on-site renewable energy? And how feasible are these on-site renewable energy options? Every community is made up of people with different backgrounds. It's important to think about the present needs of each group and identify where inequities exist and how they can be addressed through holistic design. In this category, we look at the population to understand what specific links to the community need to be considered or enhanced, and how will these needs change as the city population grows. Under social demographics, we research if 
there are opportunities to tap into or provide services that could improve education or other social initiatives. And we ask, should this building consider any demographic shifts in the near future? When we look at economic demographics, we look for opportunities to tap into or provide services that would improve the economic development of the community. Now I'm gonna show you a project where we embedded empathy into the design. This is the Robertson Lane Hotel. It's located in West Hollywood near the corner of Robertson and Santa Monica Boulevards. It will be a nine story, 225 key hotel with ground floor retail that's going for lead gold. The challenge was to design a project that ties to the neighborhood, that ties the neighborhoods together by breaking down the scale of city blocks and enhancing pedestrian connections while activating the streetscape. We did this by introducing a mid-block pedestrian lane through the core of the site. The lane creates a pedestrian experience not currently found in the area. This will be the first piece of a larger vision to connect multiple blocks together and encourage foot traffic throughout the neighborhood. Not only will this help to foster a stronger sense of community, but will also improve retail sales for the tenant as well as increase value of the lease basis. To define the project's impact on on the earth, we started with an alignment workshop called an eco charrette during the schematic design phase to establish, project, to establish the project's sustainability goals. Based on the current energy model, the project has a EUI of 55.6 and demonstrates a 52% saving over CBEX 2003 EUI baseline. The project is also considering or incorporating, 70, incorporating a 72 kilowatt solar power PV, way, PV array that could provide 2.9 percent of the building's energy. Another important element to the site is the factory building. Through our Nature of Place study, we learned the key role that this building plays in the neighborhood. Built in 1929 for the Mitchell Camera Company, this prefabricated industrial building uses a use to manufacture motion picture cameras. In the 70s and 80s, it became the world famous club known as Studio One, and today it remains an important icon in the LGBTQ plus community. Through consulting with the preservation community, we proposed rotating, rotating the factory along Robertson, making it more prominent element, and it will also feature a commemorative space telling the history and significance of the building. In the bottom left, you can see how, it's per how it was perpendicular to Robertson Lane, and in this view on the upper left, or upper right, um, it will be rotated so that it's now parallel to Robertson Boulevard. To do the, to do, excuse me, Due to the prefab nature of the factory building, we can dis disassemble it, restore it back to its original glory, and then reassemble it in its new location. We are also adapting the factory shell to perform as an en energy efficient enclosure by incorporating a system of shop fabricated wall panels behind the existing metal panels. This will increase the energy efficiency of the building and the thermal comfort for its occupants. So here are some renderings of the final design. This is a view from Lupere Pier Drive, and on the left you can see that we tucked in the drop-off area and we have a centrally located lobby with outdoor dining above it. Here you can see how the glass lobby helps to activate the street streetscape and how the lane invites people in through the site. In this view, looking down Robertson Boulevard, you can see the new prominence of the factory building and the way we broke down the scale of this large project to better suit the surrounding neighborhood. The main portion of the guest room facade is a mix between these massive eight feet by 11 feet vision panels and spandrel glazing. These large panels offer the guests access to daylight and expansive views of the surrounding area. And lastly, here's a view of the overall site. You can see how the lane connects with the Robert connects with the West Hollywood Park and cuts through the site to improve the pedestrian experience and how the factory building is now celebrated and creates a gateway into the project. By following the responsible design framework, we were able to design a project that is infused with empathy for all stakeholders. It's truly connected to the community and celebrates its history. It creates a unique experience for the users, reduces the strain on the earth and achieves the needs for the client. As we continue to apply this framework to future projects, we can bring this level of design thinking to all of the communities that we serve, no matter the budget, no matter the socioeconomic status or the racial makeup. Thank you, and if you have any questions, you can email me here. And now it's my pleasure to reintroduce artist and interior designer, Sarah Barnard.
Thank you. I will get my screen back up momentarily. Okay, perfect. Hi again. As, as we collectively navigate this new way of living, I have been grateful for the sureness of our community that uplifts with compassion, resilience, and ingenuity. Sustainability, functionality, and wellness. Can you hear me? I, I just am, I'm hearing things talking to me, like Siri or someone. Uh, scary times. We can hear you, Sarah. We can hear you, yeah. Hmm, I will try again. So sustainability, functionality, and wellness have always informed our studio's practice prior to the spread of COVID-19. These, these factors were primary, but now they're more crucial than ever. Many of us are facing challenges in caring for our loved ones. We're facing new and uncertain circumstances at work. Many of us are homeschooling children, struggling to maintain our physical and emotional well being. And in addressing these struggles, we're turning to our homes for healing interventions. We're realizing an ever expanding need for multifunctional, high performance spaces that support our lives. Now, Normative built environments can be extremely uncomfortable, even traumatic for many people. For example, individuals with PTSD and folks on the autistic spectrum may have sensitivities to sound, light, texture, and odor. People with chronic migraines and people who are chemically sensitive might also have overlapping reactivity to fragrances, sounds, and light. Research indicates that traumatic experiences don't just happen to some people, they happen to most people. In the late 1990s, Kaiser Permanente conducted a study on adverse childhood experiences, ACEs. They asked more than 13,000 of their members to complete a 10 question survey on their traumatic childhood experiences and any health issues that they're currently facing. From this pool of respondents, about two thirds had at least one ACE. 12% of the population reported an ACE score of four or more. An ACE score of four or more nearly doubles the risk of heart disease, cancer, and increases the risk of attempted suicide by 12 times. The original data was collected from a primarily white, college-educated population in San Diego. While it failed to account for traumas such as race-based discrimination, the deportation of a family member, or the death of a caregiver, it documented for the first time the relationship between trauma and negative health outcomes. Today, this now decades-old data has been consistently repeated across geographies and socioeconomic groups. Understanding that two thirds of all Americans have experienced trauma is critical to our ability to design with empathy. Even neurotypical people without exposure to trauma can easily experience cognitive overload in intensely stimulating environments. Activities like commuting, social interactions, processing large amounts of data, repetitory auditory disturbances can all impact our mental and emotional resilience in unseen ways. Because of the magnitude of stressors in public life, humans benefit in measurable ways from restorative home environments. Restoring at home can make us stronger in the workplace and in the world at large. 
When designing commercial office environments for nonprofit clients like Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation, Life Rolls On, and the National Immigration Law Center, I consider the intersections and overlap of the community members and develop strategies to accommodate the highest possible needs. For the National Immigration Law Center, I plan the relocation and expansion of their Los Angeles-based headquarters in tandem with the curation of a site-specific year-long exhibition, Defend and Advance. Highlighting artists who make work exploring identity, immigration, farm worker rights, racial justice issues, this exhibition created an opportunity for attorneys, administrators, activists, artists, and art lovers to connect to their compassionate communities. So how can designers advocate for spaces that profoundly impact healing? We must think about utilizing and expanding universal design principles to include physical, emotional, and mental health. For example, we know that biophilic design can reduce physiological and psychological stress. We know that having a comfortable place to meditate can reduce anxiety, depression, and pain. Exposure to natural light can regulate our circadian rhythms and increase serotonin levels. When access to nature isn't readily available, art is an excellent alternative solution. Viewing original works of art can stimulate the brain, providing an imaginative connection to the artist's mind and a momentary transcendence into another reality. In 2011, a University of London study found that viewing art produces a similar effect in the brain as falling in love, causing a rush of pleasure producing dopamine. Just as we consider the positive impacts of nature and art on health and well being, we also place equal importance on the selection of materials and how they can shift the feeling, the light levels, and the acoustic qualities of a space. Because truly non toxic materials are limited, our studio regularly designs textiles, wallpapers, light fixtures working with local craftspeople to fabricate safely and responsibly. While we are mindful of avoiding materials with VOCs, some non-toxic materials like linseed oil, tongue oils, and even citrus-based solvents can cause distress to people who are chemically sensitive, people undergoing chemotherapy, and people with COPD. Even as we have access to an ever-growing body of research that informs our practice of design and encourages well-being, it's nearly impossible to soothe all humans with a single design solution. Most simply put, everyone is dealing with challenges we don't know about. While we can't expect folks to come forward voicing their pain, we can help to increase agency and reduce adversity. Meeting folks where they are and creating a safe, judgment-free dialogue is the first step in designing spaces that encourage wellness. Because our area of practice is positively overlapping with so many other practice areas, we find that elements of social justice and environmental justice are impacting the way we think about our process. For example, when we think about intersectional design, we think about giving adequate attention to age, gender, ethnicity, religion, ability, education, and awareness. When we contemplate those different facets, and the way that many of us have intersecting elements from those categories, being able to create environments that are mindful and respectful of those differences is getting us closer to the empathetic place we need to be. Together, we are part of a movement to be mindful, empathetic, and collaborative, supporting one another to make all built environments spaces for healing. Thank you.
that concludes our presentation. Um, I will hand it over to our host. All right, hi everybody again. Um, so if you have any questions, could you please ask them in the chat box to the right of the screen in the Whova app? So far we don't have any questions, so. I can actually ask a question in the meantime um, while we wait for some questions to come in. So for a daisy, uh, I have a question so when you're talking about responsible design and you brought up the first example in the public housing sector, um, could you give any examples of if this, if responsible design has been implemented in public housing and potentially talk about any positive impacts that have resulted? Um, or if it hasn't, uh, what you would expect to result from implementing it in that sector? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of architects have started to make more of an effort to you know, not just look at the bottom line with their client and, you know, making the smallest minimum amount of windows and kind of forgetting that the culture that's there. There's a few projects in um, LA that have started to look at that. They do that by making sure that there's adequate outdoor space, there's community space that's, that's designed into it that helps pull the community into the building and it starts to become more of a resource. Um, there's ways to do it simply by just adding color. You know, like making sure that it's, it's a vibrant looking building and it doesn't feel like this oppressive concrete structure, but adding more color, adding more access to um, have outdoor spaces, building in amenities and just, you know, even basic green philosophies of sustainable design and making sure that you're orienting the buildings you're thinking about the heat gain. And there's so many different passive things that we can do as architects to help push that forward, even if our client isn't motivating us. Um, and so as as people become more aware and think about things more holistically, you'll start to see more of that getting infused into projects. And, you know, the community is grateful too. And connection to understand the community and see what their needs are just before diving in with a solution. A lot of times architects tend to do that as well. So um, there's, there has been a shift in that direction. And I just think it's something we need to make sure we keep in the forefront of our mind as we're designing, you know, all different types of architecture. Thank you. Uh, so there's a follow up question, a couple follow up questions. Uh, Julie is asking um, how you might get other designers on board with this. Or do you feel that designers innately do this, but not to the extent or with the conscious sustainability focus that you do? Um, I think it's, it is a bit of a shift in thinking that has to happen and understanding it because again, we have you know, and I'm guilty of this too, a habit of just wanting to run and start with the concept and not slowing down. So it's a little bit of a shift in thinking to understand you have to slow down to go fast and to get things actually, to, or to have that successful, you know, pr project in the end. You have to take the time to understand what you're doing and why and infuse more intention in what we're doing and not just trying to quickly like, okay, we're on a deadline, we just need to work towards that. So it, it's starting to happen and I think as a, you know, especially for the United States right now, as we start to put empathy in the forefront, it is getting built more into the future design projects. And there, there is a positive shift and people are understanding the value and how you, know, you can make these award-winning, beautiful designs that also respect the community that you're building in. Thank you. Um, so Sarah Waters has a question. So she was uh, looking at the renderings of the West Hollywood project that you were presenting on, uh, but didn't see as many trees as she would maybe expect. Um, she says she's an urban forestry advocate. And so she's wondering uh, what like the urban forestry plan is for that project, especially when we think about uh, reducing carbon emissions or yeah, reducing carbon and the urban heat island effect with trees. Yeah, and unfortunately, when that rendering was done, we didn't have a landscape architect fully on board. So it was just kind of little green here and there. But as we progress the design, we've got like full growth trees that are on the roof. Um, there's a big green space that's on the lower portion of the building. And so now that's actually gonna be an outdoor event lawn space. And so it's gonna have lots of trees and we've added planting down that center strip in that lane as well. Thinking, you know, about, about the experience and how, you know, the benefits of biophilia and being in type in these type of environments and having the green air spaces around you and just you know what it does for the air and so all that has been worked in it just wasn't fully developed in the rendering so <laughs> sorry about that 
I think it, it's also interesting though, Daisy, because it's, it is adjacent to a, a fairly large park in West Hollywood. And so sure. um, I think the, the, the adjacency between those two things um, can help to extend that landscape uh, into the project probably. All right, so we have another question from Melissa Cadet and she is wondering if she says all too often commercial design is governed by masculine traditional design, especially in interiors. A Daisy, how do you recommend balancing the feminine influence into design so that all cultures and genders using the building will feel comfortable in the building? Yes, um, and I'm, I'm sure Sarah and Julie can speak to this too. Uh, it's it is something that happens a lot because it is a male dominated field. And I've even had clients, like I designed something and they're like, that's too feminine. I was like, well, what does that mean? You know? And I think Sarah, you, you know, touched on it too. And you're creating that space. And so that everyone feels inclusive and that includes men and women. And so, you know, not everything needs to be this kind of traditional architecture. You can soften, add curves, add pastels, fun colors, and mix that in so that you create a more inclusive environment. Um, and I think the design trends are starting to lean that way as well, too. Like a lot of hospitality design, which is what I focus on, um, you're seeing a lot more curves in, in, injected into the space. There's softening of it. There's that whole you know, wellness component and trying to fuse that in so people feel calm, relaxed, and inviting, and not just so like hard-lined, you know, you could have a cigar in here kind of spaces. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if Sarah or Julie wants to elaborate on that, too, with their experience. Well, I, I, you know, I, I think it's a great question and I come across this a lot, um, particularly in the development world, um, where it is even more male dominated than, than architecture and design and engineering worlds. Um, and for me, it's, it's kind of a recognition of who the people are that are using your space. And it's not all 50, 60 year old white men using these spaces. And so to recognize that people come with different um, abilities or, or cultural biases to places. I, I have this example that I was working with someone who, um, you know, it was a, a shopping mall that didn't start until the second level really. And uh, they were like, well, we just need one elevator just for handicapped people. And I, and I, I sort of looked at them and said, have you ever pushed a stroller? Have you ever pushed a wheelchair? Have you ever had any kind of other um, influence to, to let you know that that's gonna be an important maneuver from this place to that place? And um, how can we make that comfortable for everybody? And, and, and particularly people who, who are mobility challenged and can't get up the stairs. So um, I, I find myself, you know, unfortunately in that role of always having to kind of question, well, what are the, what's the lens that you're looking at this problem with and do you include uh, other people in that. Sarah, did you want to weigh in on this or should I move on to the next question? Next question I think is great. All right. So this question is for you, Sarah. Uh, with the current social distancing becoming the new normal for uh, design consideration. Are there any thoughts on how to make the protective installments less cold? Not sure I totally understand that question. Could you, can you repeat that question? Yeah, I'm a little bit confused on what they're saying too, but um, maybe it's like the, the glass between workers and customers is what they're talking about. Um, how to like design that so it's less cold and isolating I see. seeming. I see. Yes. So I, I think, um, I think that we're all sort of learning as we go right now. Um, we're in rapid response and rapid adaptation. And so um, I think we are on our projects, and I'm sure as most of you are, um, trying and failing rapidly. So we're experimenting with new ideas and finding how those land within our group and outside of our group, and then, um, you know, trying again. So I don't know that we have um, any fully formed, easy solution that I can say the answer to feeling, um, you know, connected and safe and in, com in community, um, I'm not sure that, that, 
that we have a uh, simple a simple mechanism for that. Um, I think like we're talking about, everything is really going to be individualized and people's comforts are extremely varied right now. So depending on who you talk with, some folks, myself included, are still very much sheltering at home. Um, other folks have re-entered the world and are shopping at Costco. And so some, um, some people's comfort with jumping in the car and making a Costco run and you know interacting with other customers and a checker and all the possible surfaces along the way um, is very different than a person who um, is still feeling uneasy about the gas pump, right? So there are these huge ranges between what we even feel comfortable engaging in during this time of COVID. And so um, while I can't speak to you know, a magic solution to keep us connected while there are these barriers between us. I think it's gonna come back to this foundation of being mindful of um, individual experiences and understanding that um, our experiences of separation and our exper experiences of um, safety are, are dramatically different for each of us. Thank you. So um, do any of the other, Julie or Daisy, do you wanna comment on that or there's another question? I think we can go to another question. Yeah, okay. All right, this is from Katie Smith. Um, she says, Julie, I appreciate your observation of the dissonance between the design of police cars and their protect and serve tagline. Are there any proposals to make changes uh, to the design of police cars or are you seeking to push this idea? <laughs> I think it's a good question. I, I hadn't been seeking to push the idea, but now that you got me thinking more about it, um, I, I, you know, I'm reflecting on there are so many issues that are that are very particular to Los Angeles. I'm from New York and I grew up with the idea of the beat cop and someone who was in your neighborhood and someone who would you know walk around and you would know and would check in on you and you know there's just so such a vast difference between that and what we do in LA in a car um, with a bulletproof vest um, and uh, and I know people have been talking about these issues and, and working on them um, I'm, I feel like maybe we haven't made um, much progress in any of those um, so can design help to break down barriers and, and change some of those perceptions? I, I believe it could, um, but I, I guess I hadn't really uh, pushed it further to think, okay, what, you know, what could a proposal for this be? Um, but maybe I will now. All right, so I'm out of questions. If anybody in the audience has any more questions, Please put them in the chat box. I've been, it, it's been really great to kind of listen to these perspectives again. And I, I'm so pleased that the three of us, I think we have very different points of view about this issue and bring, you know, I love that Daisy is bringing this whole kind of really rigorous research aspect to this and that, that Sarah brings, um, you know, just the, the, the the innate feeling of space and how you interact um, in, in ways that really have a lot to do with health. Um, it's, you know, I'd forgotten uh, a bit of how our perspectives are different but, but aligned. And uh, so I wanna thank both of you uh, for this again and, and, and uh, being able to circle back and expand on our views on this topic. Yeah, I totally agree and with the way that 2020 has been going this year. I feel like even though we, we did this presentation last year, it's even more poignant and, and it's more of a, I think there's more of a fire underneath it to make sure that we are thinking about these things as we design future spaces and understanding that we are shaping communities. And there's so many different factors that we need to be considering as we're shaping and creating these spaces. And it's, you know, I think all of our perspectives 
complement each other really well, which is great. And all reminders of how you're thinking about, you know, the, the user, end user, how their experience is based, how it relates to the community, what the perception is, you know, is it supposed to be welcoming or is it a sheer line? Like, I love that, that uh, image you have of the police station that's, not only is it a wall, but it's like slicing through the building that exists. It's like, is that the message we want to send? Probably not if it's supposed to be, you know, protecting and serving the community. So kind of just taking a step back and assess, um, assessing how we've been treating design and then just pushing it forward and making sure that we're making an impact in the right direction. So I think as you walk around in your environment and you, you look at things and say, well, why did that, is that that way? And is that really um what someone in t intention um because I, that is where the you know being mindful i think someone asked you you know how do you incorporate this or how can we incorporate this more into design and it, it really has to do with being very mindful of what you're doing and why you're doing it and who you're serving and you can kind of give use that lens as you go through your daily life and and um when you see those plexiglass panels uh, at Target or wherever you go or wherever Sarah doesn't go right now. Um, and you think, wow, like, is this our new reality where we can't have, you know, when can we have interaction? When can we have face-to-face -face contact that nobody knew how important that was until you kind of took it away? Um, yeah, how do we even dress those up? Like, obviously we want to be safe and have a safe environment for people. But you know, that that plexiglass, whoever asked that question, it does feel very cold and you feel like you're on the other side of things. Like, is there a way to add some fun? Like maybe if it's a because literally rose colored, like rose covered glasses <laughs> actually make you feel better. So maybe they want to have a little pink hint to them or they want to have some fun, you know, design around the edge of them and ways that we can interject a little bit of sense of whimsy too to help us feel a little more at ease instead of like oh god like i'm afraid to like even touch anything on this counter and stuff and and ways to kind of break that down in a fun way but still provide that safety i think you'll start to see more challenges and more ways that people are designing in that space especially as we go back into the workforce like I, my company is still working from home 100 percent of the time and so thinking about how we now co-create together in a space but still keep our safety it's going to be an interesting challenge yeah, I'm, I'm working with a group, um, uh, so a very multidisciplinary group on on that issue of how how to come back to the workplace and um, learning lots about um, how we can extend uh, lead issues into um, you know to create healthier spaces. Um, just um, so many of the things that Sarah brought up in terms of the way people feel in the in the space, I think, are are such an important part of that. Um, people think it's just separating you know, everybody's six feet apart and putting in HEPA filters, but um, I think there's a lot more to it and a lot more to the message of how we need to all be together in this to make sure that everybody can be healthy. Mm -hmm. Thank you too. Uh, I think uh, it is really wonderful to be back together as a group and to have the opportunity to revisit this important topic. Um, I think our diverse perspectives really are aligned in an important way in that while we are working in different arenas, um, I had said to the group early on that in concept, it is possible that a human could pass through a space or touch an object designed by each of us in a singular day. And so being mindful that folks um, will move through many spaces touched by many architects and designers um, with products and experiences that impact how they feel and how they function. Uh, we are direct contributors to the quality of everyday life experience. And so I really, um, I really appreciate the two of you and I really appreciate this opportunity to be together. All right, we still have five minutes left if anybody wants to ask any more questions um, or if any of the speakers want to continue on discussing anything that uh, we haven't touched on yet. <laughs> I like reading these chats. <laughs> Katie Smith wants us to do this again, Sarah and Daisy. <laughs>
Thanks, Katie. <laughs> Katie can book us our next our next engagement. Or, or Julie to uh, Julia de Brow. <laughs> She's gonna help too. Yeah, All right, well, if nobody, or, let's see. <laughs> if no Katie one has any more <laughs> great. So yeah, we still have five minutes left, but nobody has any more questions. We could end the session five minutes early. I think that seems reasonable. Okay. <laughs> Give people All right. a break. <laughs> yeah, yeah, before the next session. Right. All right, so thank you to our speakers today. That was a really interesting discussion. I personally learned a lot. Um, so now I'll conclude this session and end the meeting. So I hope you all have a great rest of your day at MGBC. See you later. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.